Hello, in this video I'm looking forward to sharing highlights with you from the CFA's section that is called Sampling and Estimation. Now, sampling and estimation in statistics are theoretically essential and foundational. But not only that, in actual practice it's very important, which is to say this is the practice of using samples to draw inferences about the population's parameter when we don't really have access to the population, we don't have the time or resources, which is oftentimes the case. So we will look at the theory underlying that, including random sampling, what are the conditions for that, and what are the alternatives. Primarily, stratified random sampling is a good candidate. We have the central limit theorem that so powerfully informs our ability to create a confidence interval when we don't actually know the population's distribution. We'll look at what an estimator is and distinguish it definitionally from an estimate, estimator versus estimate. And finally, we'll look at the actual construction of a confidence interval and we'll just be very clear on why we need to use a student's T as opposed to a normal Z and when we can use one as an approximation for the other. So I look forward to sharing this material that I think theoretically is really fascinating. So we start with the distinction between the population parameter and the sample statistic. And in day-to-day -day usage, it's sometimes easy to get these confused or use them interchangeably, but conceptually it's important to keep the difference in mind. The population parameter is a quantity computed from or used to describe an entire population of data, whereas the sample statistic is a quantity computed from or used to describe a sample of data. So here's a simple visualization where the population is represented by the rectangle. So recall, the population represents the total set, the complete set of all of the outcome or all of the members. And in practice, it's oftentimes unrealistic to access the population, or it may just be expensive. So in many practical use cases, we're dealing with the sample, and we're trying to infer something about the population from the sample. So in this diagram, the sample's represented by the small circles. And so you can start to see why the conceptual difference is important because in this situation, there's only one population. If we were to ask ourselves, what is the average or mean of the population? You and I should get the both, should get the same uh, number for that result. This population has one average. It has a single maximum. It has a single minimum and so on. However, if we decide that we're going to each take a sample, a random sample of, say, 10 members from this larger population, my sample might be right here, and your sample might be right here, and obviously the average, that is, which is the sample statistic, will be different for each of us. So we can see now there is a many-to-one relationship. This entire population could generate any number of several samples from and each of those samples has its own sample statistics but we do expect the sample statistics to vary according to each of the different samples even as the intention is to infer something about that one population simple random sampling is when each element of the population has an equal probability of being selected to the subset and this procedure is called simple random sampling Sampling error is the difference between the observed value of a statistic and the quantity it is meant to estimate. Estimate. So we might represent this by the fact that we are taking one of those random samples from before with a small circle and then computing the sample mean, which I am going to denote here with a Roman numeral X, and I'll put a bar above it, uh, is a, that's a typical symbol for sample mean. In a previous video, I mentioned that sample statistics, by convention, we tend to use uh, Roman symbols, and population parameters tend to use Greek symbols. So you can see here my 
it's not no accident that my sample mean from some sample is represented by Roman X bar. And so that is a sample statistic uh, that estimates what we hope is the population mean. And if it's an unbiased estimator of the population mean, then we expect our expectation for that sample mean is that it is equal to, that's my attempt at a Greek mu. This, is, this would be an unbiased estimator where the expected sample mean is equal to the population mean. And so here's the sample statistic. Here's the population parameter. And this is just one property of unbiasedness because there are other properties that the estimator can have. However, when we compute this sample mean, although this is the expected value, at the same time, right, we know that each sample is going to be different. It does not surprise us that this sample mean, that any given sample mean will be different than the population parameter. Even as the expectation, the expected value of it is equal to the population mean, we actually do not expect every, uh, every uh, sample mean to equal the population mean. So sampling error is the difference between the observed value of the statistic in this case, sample mean and the quantity it is meant to estimate. And so sampling error is not something that's wrong. It's actually something that we expect and may inform the, way, the manner in which we compute these estimators. Further, and this is a, in practice, I think, becomes an important concept that in my experience teaching statistics for many years, that uh, new those of us who are brand new statistics sometimes uh, it's a difficult idea. The sampling distribution of a statistic. So we say the distribution, this is the CFA, distribution of the all distinct possible values that the, that the statistic can assume when computed from samples of the same size randomly drawn from the same population. So what do we mean by the sampling distribution of the statistic? Well, what we mean is if we keep in mind this same perspective of drawing from the... Uh, I'll just imagine what, drawing from the population with several samples. And I'm going to say sample one. Well, that's not very good. Let me try that again. Put that a little lower. Here's our population. And I'm going to go with the first sample. And I'm just going to call that sample one. And then compute the mean of that sample. The sample mean, that's obviously a sample statistic. And we... We hope that it's an unbiased estimator of the population parameter, which is the population mean. Well, okay, I'm going to compute that, and I'm just going to denote that here, x bar sub 1, and then go back. I'm doing a random sample, so I'll do another one. It may or may not overlap, depending on their relative sizes. And, and But I, I, I should have uh, imagined this circle is the same size, same sample. We go back, but this is going to be sample 2. And then I'm going to go back and get sample 3 and sample 4. And so each time I compute the sample mean and now you can see that what we are generating here is itself a set of values with its own distribution. And in fact, the sample mean, as we increase the number of uh, sample means that we draw. Uh, the central limit theorem tells us that the distribution of the sample mean as itself a random variable is going to approach the normal distribution. A very powerful and elegant theme. But the point here is that this sample mean can be treated as a random value that has its own sampling distribution of the statistic. So in stratified ra random sampling, if we imagined here, same the pop, uh, here first rectangle is a population, and we say, what do I have here? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That our sample size is going to be ten. We may take the population, and, and a simple random sample would be to draw ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten from the population randomly. However. We could also do stratified random sampling. So here we divide the population into subpopulations based on some classification. So we may decide that the population 
um, maybe maybe this is some kind of a voting poll, and we want to rather than just rather than just take a simple random sample, we want to make sure that uh, we define a strata of I'm just making this up: independents and Democrats and Republicans, and so that we are enforcing we enforcing that our random sample in, includes. Um, includes members from each of these subpopulations. So we divide the population into subpopulations based on classification criteria. And here we'll call that strata one. And uh, maybe that's, um, we define this strata is 10% because that corresponds to our estimate as is representation of the overall uh, population. Strata two and strata three. And then the only difference here from the simple random sample is we we enforce our simple random sample from each stratum proportional to the strata size. So here, if the if the random sample for the overall population was going to be ten, and strata one, let's say independence is, according to our estimate, ten percent of the overall population, then we want ten percent of the ten, or one we want to enforce. We want to make sure that our one of our draws is a random sample from this. Strata one, the independents. And similarly, if Democrats were, say, 30% of the uh, uh, overall, if that's the strata size relative to the population, we want 30% of our random sample, 30% of our 10, to be from, to be drawn from this strata. And then, and then, so in this case, you can see we still, we still have a random sample of 10, but here where we've sort of indiscriminately sampled from the entire population. Here we've enforced that there is some proportional proportionality in our sample, but we still have a sample of 10. We pull those back together. The advantages are the population subdivisions are represented, and parameter estimates have greater precision and smaller variance or dispersion than estimates obtained from simple random sampling. And so here's a sort of typical CFA type example. An analyst wants to categorize mutual funds. The mutual funds are divided into two categories based on debt and equity. Mutual funds are further categorized based on various sectors into five different sectors. So that would be technology or healthcare, for example. Furthermore, the investment can be done in a dividend or regular mutual fund. What is the number of strata that the sampling plan will entail? And the answer here would be two uh, that's debt and equity multiplied by the five sectors multiplied by this final classification of dividend and a regular mutual fund. Two multiplied by five times two gives us 20 strata and such that uh, we're going to enforce that we at least have, that our random sample at least includes some representation for every permutation here of, among these three dimensions. So the point there is this is a multiplier. So in terms of data, uh, in general, we can say it's uh, time series or cross-sectional data. I tend to think of this rectangularly. So for example, in a portfolio, um, we, could, we could represent, of course, we could represent time going down, but we can also represent it going across. So we might have a portfolio with positions, I'll just say asset one, asset two, asset three. And then we might have going, uh, th th those would be in the rows, and then columns could be time one. This could be daily, uh, today, T1 is tomorrow. Very, I mean, very stylistic here. But then a rectangle actually here could represent a typical portfolio with positions or assets in rows and then the days or weeks or months or whatever is the periodicity uh, across in columns. And so we can t refer to our data in terms of time series or cross-sectional data. Time series, in this case, going this way, the sequence of returns collected at discrete and equally spaced intervals. And so Asset, we could have here right the prices. This would be the price of asset one on asset today, all the way going out here to the price of asset one on the third day. See with subscript with matrix notation, we could represent it this way. Price of asset three, day zero, price of asset three on day three. 
then um, these prices could it would it's easy with just simple math to convert the prices to returns. Or actually, I, I would go. We would have to lag it one, but we could have the return of asset one on one, and going out to the return of asset one on comma. I'll just say day day n, and then we ha have a time series from that perspective. But on an even day, we also could have the column perspective of cross-sectional. So slicing it per the column is cross-sectional data, data on some characteristic of individuals, groups, geographical sections, or companies at a single point in time. So the feature of cross-sectional data, right, you can see, is it tends to be at a single point in time if we slice it this way. And so here's just an example of time series data if we have, we might have quarters uh, going for, let's say, the last two years where we've collected excess returns. And you may recall that when we see excess returns, right, that's going to be the ret excess return, unless otherwise specified, indicates the return in excess of the risk free rate. So that's the gross return minus the risk free rate is the excess return. So we may have collected this for the last eight quarters. Here's year one, here's year two for the quarters. So that in this year, the quarterly average excess return happens to be a clean 50 basis points. And the standard deviation uh, is uh, 311 basis points, so 3.11%. And the sharp ratio, of course, divides that average excess return by the standard deviation. So if we take 50 basis points divide by uh, 3.11, we should get about uh, 0.16 as the sharp ratio. So that's the excess return per standard deviation. And we get it for the second year as row. And also I just did that, I co-mingled as a single series all eight quarters here to get a sharp ratio of 0.3, which is somewhere in between. But this is an example of time series data here where each period is one quarter and our window is two years or eight quarters. And so that brings us to the central limit theorem, which is really a powerful idea and almost magical to me. The, uh, it tells us that a population described by any probability distribution having a some population mean and finite variance. So the condition is really merely finite variance. The sampling distribution of the sample mean computed from samples of size n from this population will be approximately normal with mean of mu and variance of here, the population variance divided by n, when the sample size is large enough. And so statistically, by convention, we tend to when we say a large distribution, we tend to mean greater than or equal to 30, or if you like, greater than 30. I've seen it both ways, I think. The point here is that then uh, when the sample size is large, we tend we can rely on the sample on the central limit theorem, and the central limit theorem, uh, uh, assuming assuming this modest condition about the finite variance, the central limit theorem tells us about the distribution of the sample mean, right? That's X bar. So I'm going to write that out very specifically and symbolically. We're going to say sample mean X bar is itself approximately normal with mean uh, given by the population mean. So we do expect the sample mean to approximate the population me mean, right? That's our sample statistic. That's our population parameter with this sample mean itself with variance of sigma squared divided by N. So that's a Greek sigma there. That's the, that's the population's variance, but that population's variance is divided by n. So as n increases, you can see this, this variance here of the sample mean is diminishing and in fact tending toward zero. So this is extremely powerful and probably the most powerful aspect of this 
is what we've highlighted here. Any probability distribution. We do not need to know or uh, infor assume any conditions or requirements on the distribution of the population. Put another way, the population distribution does not itself need to be normal as long as our sample size is large enough. We are, uh, and as the size increases, we can increasingly assume that the normal distribution is a uh, is a fair or safe approximator of the behavior here of that sample mean as a random variable. So extremely powerful idea. And uh, of course, we just said that this sample mean has a variance of sigma squared over n. That's a variance. If we take the square root of that variance, right, we'll get sigma over n as a standard deviation. So this then, sigma over n, is the standard deviation of that sample statistic that is the sample mean. When we take a standard deviation of a sample statistic, we call it a standard error, right? So I would remind you that, not to get too... Um, confused by this terminology here, the standard error is a standard deviation. It just happens to refer to the standard deviation of a sampling statistic, which in this case is the sample mean. So, oh, and uh, oh, excuse me, when I did that here, I forgot to do the, right, I square root here. I square rooted here our variance to get the standard deviation. So, and I forgot to take a standard deviation. I forgot to take the square root of the denominator as well. So here is our standard deviation of the sample mean. And because it's a sample statistic, we just happen to call it a standard error. It was not wrong to call it a standard deviation. And so, of course, if we know the population variance sigma, then that's our answer. However, as we, as we constantly say, we oftentimes realistically don't know the population parameter, but we have the sample, so we use that. And notice here again, telltale sign, the Greek sigma is replaced by the Roman S, and the Roman S tells us sample mean. So we use the sample mean because that's what we've got, and we know that it's a, an unbiased estimator of the... Uh, Oh, I said mean, but I meant um, sample, I'm sorry. Sigma is the population standard deviation, and so small s here is the sample standard deviation. So we don't know the population standard deviation. We are replacing it effectively with the sample standard deviation because we do have that, and we assume that it estimates the population standard deviation. So when the population variance is not known here, then the standard error of the sample mean is given here by this values that we do know. The standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. So that's our standard. In practice, that's going to be our standard error, which is again just the standard deviation of the sample mean. And how do we get the standard deviation from our sample? Well, that's given here by formula that I think we covered in the previous video. This is the, this is the variance of the sample. And you can see it's really the, uh, in the numerator, we're squaring each of the De we're squaring the deviation between the observation and the sample mean, and then we're dividing that by n minus 1. So I call that an almost average as opposed to an average, um, because that's the choice there, to divide it by n or n minus 1. But you may recall I mentioned a way to remember n minus 1 is that's going to be the more conservative value, right, because that's going to give us a larger sample variance. So that's the formula for our sample variance which in practice in that in a previous video I did mention that we do it it is okay uh, in the case in certain cases like in terms of daily returns to make the simplifying assumptions 
assume the sample mean is zero, and also to uh, use the n instead of n minus one. Different type of estimator here, not to, not to spend too much time on that, but that uh, just switches us from an unbiased to an MLE estimator, such that uh, the sample variance uh, in the case of daily returns is commonly simply the average squared return. Okay, so here's an example. Let's just say, um, let's say uh, that we draw a sample of 81 observations and the standard deviation of that sample is five. What does the standard error of the sample mean? Well, the, the standard error is the uh, standard deviation of either the population, which we don't have, or the sample, in this case, which we can compute, divided by the square root of the sample size. So in this case, it's 5 divided by the square root of 81, or 5 divided by 9. Point estimators. Uh, estimators are formulas used to calculate sample mean and other sample statistics. Estimates are values calculated using an estimator, and point estimates are the sample statistic used as an estimate of the population statistic. So that's some terminology here, but the way that I was taught this and the way that I remember is that the estimator is like the recipe, right? So if we're talking about a sample mean, Roman numeral X bar, we know that equals X plus. We take each of the values, X plus 2, X plus 3, out to x plus n, and then we're going to divide it by n. It gives us a sample mean. Well, this is the estimator. Here's the recipe. And then if I apply that on a sample and I get, let's say, 5.23, that's our estimate. The, recipe, the estimator is the recipe that produces the value. That's the estimate. That's why you'll see me. I try to be careful. I don't always get that perfectly right to, to be mindful of the fact that I'm talking whether I'm talking about the estimate as the value, which is produced by the estimator, which is the recipe that produces it. So estimators, uh, there are different ways to generate. If we think about estimators now as these recipes, including uh, the most obvious example in this case would be that sample variance. If we take a sample and we say, and we'll denote that Roman S, sample variance squared, right? We're, we may we may think that uh, we may expect that it equals the population variance. That may be our estimation. However, there are different ways to calculate the sample variance and they all they won't all necessarily exhibit this behavior of unbiasedness. right? So we take that sample variance and, you and I may each be given a, the same sample, and I may decide to do it the short way. I may just decide if these are, let's say these are daily returns. I may just decide to sum the returns, sum the squared returns, and divide by the number of them and produce a sample variance. And that is a valid sample variance. You may decide to be more tech, technically accurate you may decide to take each return, um, its difference from the average return, square that difference, and divide the sum of that by n minus 1. That's the formula we just saw. You're going to get a different answer, are you not? The estimates, that's the values, are going to be different for us because our estimators, these are the recipes, are different. Neither of our variance, sample variances are incorrect. They are both correct. They are just different estimators with different properties. Yours will be unbiased. And that's why I said, maybe I suggested that yours may be technically superior because it's unbiased. Mine is not. Mine is actually not unbiased. It is biased. And so then understanding that, we can understand how there can be different recipes or estimators for um, for different measures, and then the discussion is about what are the properties of that estimator, and we can consider the trade-offs. Maybe, you know, do we want 
Uh, do we want a, an unbiased estimator? Well, then we should use this one. Or maybe mine has a different a feature, a, a, a property that is advantageous that makes mine more useful. So desirable properties of the estimators included, of course, the unbiasedness. That's one in whose, an unbiased estimator is one whose expected value equals the parameter is intended to estimate it. Efficiency is an unbiased estimator if no other unbiased estimator of the same parameter has a sampling distribution with smaller variance. So an efficient estimator uh, arbitrates between two unbiased estimators. We may both generate an unbiased estimator, then the efficient one is the one with the smaller variance. A consistent estimator is one for which the probability of estimates close to the value of the population parameter increases of the sample size. So consistency is one where if we want to improve the, the estimate that's produced by the estimator, we can increase the sample size. It's going to start to converge on the population parameter. And now I inserted this because in ordinary and classical linear regression model, ordinary least squared estimates, right? This is the generation. This is the one way, to, the most popular way to generate a regression line through, through a scatter plot. Um, the, under that method, those coefficients, uh, those estimates are actually blue, which is to say that's an acronym for best linear unbiased estimator. So that's an estimator you can see that just met all three of the properties that we just looked at. Best here, best here just means minimum, minim, minimum, excuse me, minimum variance among among unbiased among un, among the unbiased estimators and we just called that efficient right that was our definition of efficient if we have two unbiased estimators the one with minimum variance is the efficient one and this is what uh, best here means, so best is it's best or efficient, linear unbiased estimator. That's blue. The coefficients in, a, in an OLS, classical linear regression model, are blue. And so they are very desirable estimates produced by these estimators that are blue because <clears throat> they meet several of these properties. And you can see that becomes a whole deep topic because when you talk about a scatter plot, right, and drawing a line, well, there are many different algorithms, even just to, as that would determine how we draw a straight line through a scatter plot. Many different algorithms, many different decision rules. This, the most classic of OLS, which is really minimizing the summation of these square distances from the fit line gives us these coefficients that are setting themselves estimates that are blue. And by blue, you can see here, it meets these all three of these properties and just in general makes them quite desirable estimators. So uh, the confidence interval for the population mean is very common statistical analysis to perform. That's the range for which we can assert with some given probability of one minus alpha, called the degree of confidence, that it will contain the parameters intended to estimate. So our confidence interval here is defined by the point estimate, plus or minus here, the what the uh, CFA is calling the reliable factor, and we've denoted here with the normal Z. And so that's going to be a normal distribution quantile that's a function of the desired confidence. So it's going to, excuse me, it's going to scale, act as a multiplier on, this looks familiar, it's the standard error, which again is that standard deviation of the sampling statistic, which in this case happens to be the sample mean. So we're carving out a confidence interval around the observed, in this case sample mean, by multiplying or scaling the standard error based on our confidence. A larger Z value 
for greater confidence, we'll need to carve out a wider interval. Okay, so in terms of these reliable reliability factors, which I tend to think of quantiles on the normal standard distribution, these are the ones that we tend to memorize rather than have to look up. 90% confidence interval, our, notice our Z value here is 1.65. And so visually, if we imagine a standard normal distribution here, right? And then I take the, if I go out here to the, oh, uh, let's see here, one point, the quant, that's what I call the quantile, 1.65. This standard normal is symmetrical, meaning over here there's a negative 1.65. These are that confidence interval by default by default, but not necessity, is two-sided confidence interval. So these are really a, this is really a two-sided or two-tailed type of test or interval. 1.65, if, if we did a cumulative distribution function here from this quantile, we would see that 95% of this distribution is to the left of this quantile on the CDF. Nine, and 5% is over here. So at this quantile on the standard normal, um, this is an extremely popular quantile in risk. So um, it's etched into my memory the fact that over here in this tail, if we talk about the area in this tail or the probability, therefore, randomly of ending up in this tail, it's 5% at 1.65. It's actually 1.645 if we want to take it out to three decimals. So this, it's, uh, this value itself is, is rounded. But what we have here is 5% in the tail, 95% all the way to the left. But our confidence interval is two-sided. So we have 5% over here. And so you can see how 1.65 is a two-sided quantile if our confidence is 90% because 5 and 5 on each of the tails is 10 outside here of a 90% region in the middle. So our 90% confidence interval is just going to take 1.65 and scale or multiply that standard error in order for us to carve out the confidence interval. Right, That's the multiplier on the standard error, which is a standard deviation. Oh, and then 95% uh, two-sided, that's 1.96. CFA candidates do tend to memorize this, uh, well, and financial students in general. 99% confidence, the two-sided quantile there, or uh, if you like, normal Z critical value is 2.58. Okay, so let's just look at an example, a random sample of 100. New York Stock Exchange stocks is an average sharp ratio of 0.75. So that's our sample mean. The sharp ratio of all stocks follows a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 0.25. So equivalently, if we didn't know that, we wouldn't necessarily know that for all stocks. Equivalently, the assumption here could be that the standard deviation in our sample is 0.25, right? Because we're going to make that, we can make that replacement. And then the question is, what is the 90% confidence interval for the mean sharp ratio of all stocks in the New York Stock Exchange? So what we have here are above the line here are three known assumptions. Standard deviation here, let's say of the sample or the population is 0.25 and our sample size is 100. Well, we can get the standard error, can't we? We can see that the standard error here we know is, let's say, sample standard deviation divided by square root of n, so it's 0.25 divided by square root of 100, so it's 0.25 divided by 10, so lucky for me, it's 0 0.025 is my standard error. And so then for the two-tailed confidence interval at 90%, we just saw that that uh, reliability factor, what the CFA calls a reliability factor, is 1.64. So how do we carve this out? Well, we this confidence interval, well, we take our 0 0.75, right, and we add or subtract 0.25. 
the reliability factor of 1.64, which is just scaling or multiplying the actual standard deviation, which is the standard error that I've already computed, point, point zero two five, or maybe I'll just put, um, maybe I'll just put uh, parentheses around that to signify that these are multiplied quantities, quantities, right? So sample mean plus or minus reliability factor 1.64 multiplied by the standard error should give us here this confidence interval that surrounds or goes around, in this case, symmetrically, it should go around the 0.75, right? Which it looks to, it looks to do. But that's 90%. If I wanted to step this up, to 95%, the only thing that our standard error doesn't change is still 0 0.025. It's just our reliability factor that increases. We now go from 90 to 95%. This increases, and you can see our confidence interval widens. <clears throat> but it's still symmetrical around the 0.75. And we can step it up even to very common is a 99%, especially in risk. And so that would be 2.58, and you can see the confidence interval widens even more. So next, we are introduced to the student's t distribution, and why does this come now in the CFA syllabus, right, adjacent to the normal? Well, for a very important reason, because we end up using the student's t distribution extremely often um, in statistical tests of the sample mean, and also in regression coefficients, because technically speaking, the regression coefficients are conditional sample means. So the student's t ends up being appropriate as a kind of substitute for the normal distribution, and for this reason is extremely common. And just briefly, just in technical terms, um, the idea here is that right our sample mean the difference between our sample mean and the population mean, right, that's a raw difference, then standardized by the standard error, where that standard error is itself, right, population standard deviation divided by square root of n. This itself, this is the logic we've been using, is a random variable that is approximately normal according to the uh, central limit theorem. And so this is, um, however, in, in, re in reality, we take the sample mean, we uh, can refer to its distance from the hypothesized, null hypothesized population mean, divide it by the standard error, but in reality, we don't know the population standard deviation. We have a null hypothesis. That's the easy part. But uh, the population standard deviation we don't have. So we use the sample standard deviation and divide it by the square root of n because, of course, we have the sample size. So you see how the correspondence, the, the logic of the formula is exactly the same. It The numerator is a observed raw difference is an observed difference in raw terms between the observed sample mean and our null hypothesized value that we are simply uh, standardizing by dividing it by the standard error. Or I suppose we could say uh, normalizing. Um, so the logic there is the same except the fact that we need to substitute that unknown population standard deviation with the sample standard deviation. And then that makes this a student's t distributed variable with degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1. And so because in practice, we're almost always using the sample standard deviation to compute the standard error, that means, strictly speaking, we almost always should be using the student's t. The only thing is, as the sample gets large, it gets pretty much, the student's t starts to converge on the normal. So in large samples, we go back to using the normal because it doesn't make much of a difference. But the th in theory here, just wanted to note that 
the, the random variable here is really characterized by the student's t. And that's why it's no accident that student's t distribution among all the distributions is located here in the syllabus because it's so important. The student's d is symmetric is a symmetrical probability distribution defined by a single parameter, degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1. In this context, that's sample size minus 1. And it has always heavier tails than the normal distribution. Right? So I just want to make that point. The student's t always has a heavier tail distribution. Uh, we, we say that's leptokurtosis. You could also say the excess kurtosis is greater than zero. Excess kurtosis is just kurtosis minus three. So that means the kurtosis is all, always greater than three. That means there's more density in the student's t-tail than there is in the corresponding normal as, as we get out here in the uh, tails. On the right here, I have a sort of textbook representation here of the normal is in dashed black and then I have two students t because there's only one standard normal right I don't need any parameters for the standard normal standard normal is mean zero variance one but the students t actually varies according to the degrees of freedom so here in red I have a students t with de degrees of freedom only three so that's a that has fatter or heavier tails i prefer the language heavier tails means more density in the tail you can see in red so there's just going to be um, if we go out here to negative four or less there's going to be a slightly greater probability in the students t of those outcomes relative to the normal and you can see that here because the red the red is above the uh, black normal here as we get on the tail. And then the blue is degrees of freedom of 10, and so it's hard to see, but it's also above the dashed black line. The blue has slightly heavier tails than the normal, and so that, that I would say is the key feature that um, the student's T has slightly heavier tails. They're always heavier than the normal. This is important from a risk perspective, but but I'll also say that you can just see visually, it's not as if they are massively heavy tails. They are not. There are other distributions. If our purpose is heavy tails, there are other much better distributions. If we do want heavy tails in the student's T, we really need to dial down the degrees of freedom. Here I have the textbook, student's T, which oftentimes has the uh, peak is below the normal, which leads to confusion among those who are studying carefully because uh, most people expect a higher peak because heavier tail distributions tend to be associated with peakedness. In fact, some textbooks will refer to kurtosis as peakedness. Okay, so without going into detail on that, I just want to say that that's actually approximately true. Here is a better rendition here where I've used uh, ggplot to draw a standardized student's t. What did I change? The only thing I change is I enforced unit variance on my standard on my student's t so that I'm comparing apples to apples. So that which is to say that in many textbooks it's actually this is actually an optical illusion borderline deceptive and leads to confusion because an apples to apples comparison of students T would be standardized students T. Here I'm showing you students T with unit variance compared to uh, standard normal, which by definition has unit variance, apples to apples. And we can see that, yes, actually uh, the students T is peaked compared to the normal, uh, meeting our general expectation that heavy tailed distributions do in fact tend to be peakedness. There are some exceptions, purists will note, but it's actually hard to generate an exception based on the fact that distributions have tails, shoulders, and bodies, and the way that the density is we pull, is there's more density here in the tails, it gets pulled out of the shoulders and into the peaks as a general rule. So exceptions are hard to find. It is generally true to say that the uh, le uh, leptokurtotic distributions have higher peaks. However, it's just more accurate to focus on the fact that leptokurtotic 
the distributions like the student's t by definition are heavy tailed. So enough on that. I think the more important uh, idea slide is right here. The basis of computing our reliability factors, right? When we're carving out that confidence interval around the sample mean, right, we are basically choosing here between a normal Z reliability factor or a student's T. And here's the rule. And you can see in the top two, if we're sampling from a normal distribution with known variance, we can use the Z, the Z distribution, the normal Z reliability factor. After all, we know it's a normal distribution and we're given the nor known variance. Why does that matter? Well, that's because if we have the known variance, we can compute the accurate standard error, right? We can compute this standard error. If we're sampling from a normal distribution with unknown variance, then the problem, the realistic problem, it's not a major problem, is that we're using the sample standard deviation as our as a substitute really. And so we really should use the student's T. Notice that's for a small sample. It's okay because we know it's a we're no we're sampling for normal distribution. If it's a large sample, notice here so I think this row is very instructive. Um, we're, we're actually, we actually, it's correct to use the student's T, and right, this is just this is just confirming this idea that why are we using the student's T here even when we're sampling from normal distribution? It's the fact that we don't know the variance, and an unknown variance is being used, and a sample. Uh, variance or standard deviation is informing our standard error. So our standard error is becoming an estimate, and that's why we should use the student's T. But it's a large sample, so we know the student's T is converging on the normal, so it's okay to use the Z here. But if you're with me so far, it's a, it's a, it's a theoretical matter. It's not the student's T that's approximating the Z here. It's actually, we're using the Z as a matter of convenience because it's approximating the student's T that's actually the correct value. Okay, then we get to non-normal distrib distributions, right? Notice here, I think these are significant. Non-normal distribution, and if you think about it, in realistic cases and most realistic cases, we don't know uh, what the distribution is. If, we're, if we have a small sample, we actually don't have any reliability factor. We don't have a basis here for statistical confidence interval, right? Nothing's really available to us. Hence the importance of large samples. So I just think these, these, two, row, this, these two rows are really instructive because this is reality most of the time. We don't know the distribution. And so we're sort of stuck with a small sample. Hence, the, in terms of a in terms of estimating the population, hence the importance of going to a large sample. And then suddenly, this is the part I love, we go from being stuck in a small sample, because we don't know the distribution, to, by virtue of the magic of the central limit theorem, having available to us either the Z or the student's T. If we go from being stuck, all we need is the large sample, and then we don't even need to know the variance. We can use the student's T. And in fact, a large sample, that's why. In large samples, you'll oftentimes see people just using the Z, regardless of whether they know the variance or more realistically, they don't know the variance. Here, we don't know a lot. Non-normal distribution with unknown variance. We would be totally stuck in the small sample, but central limit theorem really magically almost magically, avails us of the ability to use a Z here. So I think it's just a key slide. And so selection of the sample size, large sample size, decreases the standard error and consequently decreases the width of the confidence interval. So you can see now, by virtue of the fact that we've used this standard error in that confidence interval, right? we said confidence interval equals our estimate, plus and minus, our reliability factors. So I'm just going to call that the Z based on, let's say, 
uh, alpha divided by 2, and we're multiplying that by a standard error, which is going to be sample size divided by square root of n. Not, not, not sample size, sorry. Sample standard deviation. Right, so the key idea here is that if we think about our the width of that confidence interval in the standard error, it's a scaling not with, it's not that if n isn't buying us more accuracy in a linear fashion, it's with the square root of n. So this is very thematic in statistics. This uh, relationship as we're actually, we're at, our, we're, our purchase is in terms of the square root of n. We need greater precision, but but if we want to times 10 that precision, you can see what we need to do is times 100 on the sample size, right? If we want to double that precision, we need four times the sample size. So sampling bias data mining is determined uh, is determining a model by extensively searching through a data set for statistically significant patterns. Data mining bias occurs due to overuse of data in search of specific patterns. Out of sample tests can help in checking if the model has data mining bias. A warning signs for a potential existence of data mining bias would be too much digging, too little confidence, no story, no future. Uh, sample selection bias is excluding some data in the analysis due to non availability. Survivorship bias is excluding companies, mutual funds, and return of performance analysis, which are no longer in existence. So that's a common problem, right? If we just think about uh, a historical window here at time zero, and we started with all of these funds, right? But maybe this first one failed, and this last one failed, and the other ones went on, and we go measure the sample here. Survivorship bias is the fact that we're, our sample is inherently the survivors, and it's excluding these ones that failed, which really should be zeros. Look-ahead bias, using information that was not available on the, on the test date. And time period bias, results of the analysis are specific to a time period. A short time period may give period-specific results that are not reflective of a longer period. A longer time period may have structural changes resulting in two distributions. Okay, so that's really um, uh, all that I have to show. And that's been just about an hour, so that's a lot of material. But I hope it's a helpful review of the CFA in terms of uh, sample and estimation. Thank you.